pull this off. It would be legendary. First, I want to discuss a couple problem or a couple comments here in the in the YouTube chat. Brooks Scott says, "My big pro- my biggest problem is O doing the opposite of what got him a national championship. Surround yourself with an elite staff with a great scheme. If Bo Pelini and Coach Insminger leave, neither would be an OC or DC anywhere else in D one." Pretty fair point there by Brooks Godberry. Uh, and, and this almost becomes a larger question about the hiring practices at LSU. Now, uh, Swamp Dragon with the deep, deep theory here says hiring retread Pelini. Oh, wait, no, no. It was, uh, this is Tony Roya. I seriously think Pelini was a hold hire for someone who will be available either this year or next year. Just wish I knew who, LOL. I wish you were right there, Tony, but the problem is the three-year, $6.9 million fully guaranteed contract would speak to that uh, not actually being the case unless you're playing the most expensive 4D chess that I could possibly imagine. Um, and so I, I, I talk about the, the hiring process, right? Because going on, uh, who was it? Phil G says, how does... He says, exactly, how does O go from young and innovative OC to where they are now? Does O need to be baby, or O needs to be babysat on these coaching hires? Brady fell into his lap, and Aranda was already here. The rest have been bad. Now, you want to criticize credits, do you want to credit where credits do? You want to be objective. Uh, you cannot say that Brady fell into his lap. Brady gave a presentation at LSU, uh, as the Saints normally do, when, um, the, you know, the, just a little meeting of the minds between the two staffs. And Brady blew away the room. And O was the one who said, we have to have this guy. So don't, like, there's enough criticism to go around without creating false criticism. So, yes, absolutely, O was responsible um, for hiring Joe Brady. Unfortunately, outside of that, when you look at the Matt Canada hire, and I'm not going to, I think the Ensminger hire is still a good one. I I can't, I, I, I can't argue with that. I know that it was a very... Uh, and who knows when it comes what without Joe Brady, but the point is, I think both those guys actually worked better in tandem than either one would have alone. So I put both those in a positive hiring category. But then you look at Canada, no. Pellini, no. And the, so if we're being generous, that's about a 50% hit rate. If we're being uh, less generous, because you probably throw Linehan in the no category as well, you, depending on how you want to sort it out, you could bump it down to like a 25 or 33% hit rate. Uh, even the 50, though, is a bit concerning. Hiring's hard. I understand that, right? But when, remember the entire pitch that we were talking about at the beginning of all this is the CEO model, where a head coach's game day responsibilities are sometimes, you know, less than 50% of the job. When you talk about recruiting, when you talk about managing boosters and relationships and just everything else that you have to do, you are a, very much a politician, a CEO type of person when you're the head coach of one of these major football programs. And so the idea behind this setup is that you have to hire well, right? And ideally, you're going to be hiring a lot because that means you're doing it right. If you're having guys go on to get bigger and better jobs, thumbs up, you made a very good hire. Unfortunately, when you look at the staff right now, who will go on to get a bigger and better job? Almost no one. And so when you adopt that CEO model, you do become very dependent on those hires being successful. And you've missed enough now with Canada, which turned out to be an abject disaster, and Bo Pelini, which we'll see what happens in these final three games, but even with the really good A&M game, has been an abject disaster. Literally record-settingly bad. Linehan hasn't been a disaster, but it hasn't really done anything anyway. That's the most offensive part about Scott Linehan is it just feels like he's there. It just feels like you're paying him to copy and paste the same offense from last season. Where are the wrinkles? Where's the innovations that Lanahan's bringing to the table? And so when you look at those hires, you have to ask yourself, okay, what is it in our hiring process, in our hiring philosophies? And I do find it a bit interesting, and I don't know why this is or how exactly you would explain this, but in Joe Brady, you had a very young and innovative mind. Dave Aranda a relatively young and, yes, still innovative mind, and yet who do you replace those guys with? Old retreads. And, you know, being on this side of the mic, um, I was just as wrong, right? I sat here and I applauded these hires, and I gave them the benefit of the doubt. 
And I thought it made sense. And it's because I thought that the staff had earned the benefit of the doubt. Well, look, we comment on what's happening, right? And I never pretend to be right all the time. I mean, whatever. You're trying to predict the future. You're wrong just as much as you're right. If the degeneration dome is any indication, you're wrong way more than you are right. So I'm not saying that I would do any better if I was in a higher position. I would do any better that is currently coaching on that staff. But at the same time, I am not paid very handsomely to do that job. That is not my job. And so it does cause you to be getting now with hindsight, the benefit of hindsight, it's 2020. It does, you do have to, LSU needs to do some serious self-evaluation and ask them what has gone so wrong in our hiring process. And if you want to look for local sports parallels that you can draw, look no further than what me and Jeff Duncan were talking about in this hour yesterday. The New Orleans Saints front office, pre-Jeff Ireland, and I'm blanking on the other player personnel guy that made a big difference for them. But pre the front office sh- sh- turnover and Ryan Pace and the Bears, all these guys leave, the Saints may have been the worst front office in the NFL. At that moment, in the previous five years, not only have they been seven and nine, three of those years, but in the previous five years, they had drafted the least amount of players in the NFL. So they had given up the most draft picks, and then out of those picks, they had the lowest percentage of picks in the NFL actually remaining on their roster. So not only were you not drafting enough, you were not value picks enough, but you were striking out on all your picks. And then you combine that with like the Jarris Bird contract, the Junior Gallette contract. I mean, losing Darren Sproles when you lost him, when he went on to help Philly win another Super like. He went on to have great success over there. I mean, Malcolm Jenkins, the list goes on and on. The guys that you sacrificed at the altar for these bad contracts. And so the Saints had to sit there as they were maybe going to go 7-5 and five again for the fourth time in five years, which they managed to avoid, but it was three times. But they had to sit there, and they had to be painfully honest with themselves. What mistakes have we made that led to this? What is wrong with our core philosophies? that is causing us to strike out on so many of these draft picks? Why are we not evaluating these these pro players correctly? Now, unfortunately, I don't think I have enough information to comment on the specifics of what was so wrong in that evaluation process and what exactly they changed to fix it. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I mean, this would be something fascinating to talk to, like, Jeff Ireland about because as the – head of scouting college players, ever since he has come in, the Saints drafts have been astounding. They have been stellar. It's kind of wild where their hit rate is at right now. And then, make no mistake, look at where the team is at right now. It's literally the most complete roster in the entirety of the NFL. And that's because they changed some personnel, they changed some core philosophies, they were honest with themselves about where they were misstepping and where they were going wrong. And then all of a sudden, when you get the personnel right again, well, then Sean Payton's strengths and his offensive creativity and his mind could shine once again. And you also look at the Saints. For a while there, they wanted Drew Brees to make up for offensive line deficiencies, right? They weren't paying guards. They weren't paying centers, whatever. Deal with that. And Brees started to struggle. Then they trade for Max Unger. Again, they say, what are we doing wrong? They trade for Max Unger. It writes the ship, and Brees is back. And so if LSU right now, this staff and administration, If they can handle it, if they want to be successful, they have to be fully honest and objective with themselves. They have to look at this staff. They have to, like I said, be ruthless, cold-blooded about who is working, who is not, who is underwhelming. If somebody is wrong, why did you hire them? And then what values or kind of core philosophies can you change in the future to avoid making that mistake again, and you only get so many chances at this. Sean Payton has a long rope. He won a Super Bowl. His 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 skins on the wall speak for itself, right? I mean, even at that time, amidst those seven to nine seasons struggling teams, if Sean Payton was to hit the open market, he would be scooped up at about $9 million a year. It's why he got that huge extension in the middle of those struggles. It's because his talent was still obvious. So let's see if LSU can do a uh, similar sort of soul-searching This offseason, and in my opinion, if you want to right the ship long term, and if if, if you're Coach O and you want to remain the coach at LSU long term, that is going to be key to making it happen. So 
We'll see, man. It's tough. It's really tough to be honest with yourself. I lie to myself all the time. I think if we're being honest, most of us do. At times, we make excuses for ourselves. And unfortunately, in big-time college football, where the margins are so tiny that determine you know a win, a loss, a national championship, or nothing, you have to be more ruthless than us, the average people are. And we'll see if they can do that. Uh, all right, when we get back, we'll get into the Alabama statistical breakdown, and then I want to talk Saints-Falcons part two, as I've got some uh, thoughts on how this thing could play out on Sunday. This is OTBOT. Give me all your comments in the Bayou 4 YouTube chat. We'll get to them as well here on 104.5, 100.3, and 94.7 ESPN.